Family Mode. Hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Thank you for joining us. We are just about to begin this webinar, Technology and Data Collection. We are going to wait just a few extra minutes. We have a wonderful list of registrants for this web webinar, so we want to offer a few more minutes for people to get set up and sign on. So bear with us just a few more moments, and we'll get started. Thank you so much. Okay, good morning everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Wherever you are joining us from in the world, a warm welcome to all of you. We're so glad that you could join us today for this webinar, Technology and Data Collection, Allies in Women-Centric Energy Access Programs. 
This webinar is one in a series. It's actually the eighth webinar organized uh, in as part of this program. You can already mark your calendars. The next webinar will be November 17th on political economy and how it can be a tool for gender equality in the energy sector. My name is Kate Oren. I am thrilled to be with you today. I'm a senior officer with the IUCN Global Gender Office. And it's my pleasure and honor, and I'm very humbled to stand in today in place for Ana Rojas, my colleague uh, who manages all of the energy work for our office. Uh, she had a family emergency, as some of you may know, and she sends her regrets to not be able to be with us today. I want to thank you again for joining us, and a special thank you to our extraordinary panelists. I did have a sneak peek at the presentations first thing this morning, and we are in for some incredible presentations over the next 90 minutes or so. I must thank uh, USAID at the very beginning for their support and their partnership. Uh, this webinar is organized under the auspices of the GECCO Initiative, the Gender Equality for Climate Change Opportunities Initiative. And this particular webinar is also very special to us because it's organized in partnership with a longtime partner, ally, friend organization, Energia, the International Network on Gender and Sustainable Energy. Before I go on to introduce the webinar uh, content and panelists for today, I want to go through a couple of very important virtual housekeeping matters, if you will. All participants will be kept in the mute function during the duration of the webinar. This is to avoid disturbances with uh, connectivity interruptions, background noises, etc. You are very much encouraged, however, to participate throughout. You can send any uh, questions or if you're having any issues with connection or hearing, please feel free to use the chat function at the bottom of the little control panel that you probably have at the right hand side of your screen. And very importantly, please feel free to keep track of your questions, send your questions throughout to the speakers. There's a particular questions function also on the right hand side of this control panel. Uh, it's quite easy to use, so you just send your questions throughout or of course feel free to keep track of them and we'll be collecting questions at the end. The way this webinar will be structured is I'll give a few minutes of introduction. I will then introduce our three presentations. And then we will be doing, we're trying to save 25 to 30 minutes at the end to have all of the questions and discussion. I'd like to introduce two of my wonderful colleagues who are on the line, Maria Preble, who works with Ana Rojas to implement all of our energy work, as well as Maggie Roth, who also implements the energy work, but most importantly this morning, she is our communications officer extraordinaire from the IUCN Global Gender Office, and she will be supporting all of the technical aspects for this webinar. You have her email because she's the one who sent you the invitation and the reminders for this webinar, so feel free to reach out to her by email or by the chat function, again, in the control panel. Maggie will also be collecting all of the questions that you send in, and we'll go through those, and I promise I will try to get to as many of them as we possibly can. And if your questions are not answered, we invite you to email us, email the panelists, all the emails will be made available, and most importantly, stay part of the conversation and join us as part of the green platform. This webinar will be recorded and posted, as all of the webinars are, on our green platform, G-R-E-E-N. This is a platform of resources, uh, discussion platforms, sharing of experiences amongst regions, and you can get there at genderandenvironment.org slash energy. That address will also be posted later in this presentation. As I mentioned, this webinar is organized under the auspices of the GECCO Initiative. This is a five-year joint program launched between USAID and IUCN in 2014. And the purpose is to leverage advancements in women's empowerment and gender equality through and for the benefit of climate change and development outcomes. There is a wide scope of work under the GECCO Initiative, but a major focus of ours is energy. GECCO's energy work supports the energy sector and the mitigation sector in particular to be gender responsive by filling knowledge gaps, for integrating gender into the energy sector, 
through the sharing of practices and encouraging documentation of experiences and new knowledge creation. The Green Platform, as I mentioned, is also organized under the Gecko Initiative, as is this webinar series. Again, we're also thrilled to be partnering for this particular webinar with our longtime friend and partner, Energia. Energia was founded in 1996 by an extraordinary group of women involved in gender and energy work in a wide range of developing countries. Energia's vision is for women and men to have equitable access to and control over sustainable energy services as an essential right to development. They have a very wide array of members and ongoing programs in 12 countries, and Energia is hosted by the Hevos Foundation based in the Netherlands. So the purpose of this discussion today Energy is fundamental to development, as we all know, from reducing drudgery to supporting productive activities and services, including education, transport, and communications. But still, over a billion people do not have access to electricity, and close to three billion rely on traditional fuels. Energy access interventions are designed to reduce energy poverty and have the opportunity of doing so while addressing key gender gaps, for example, increasing widespread well-being and lifting women and their families out of poverty. As a result of this increasing understanding, these linkages, and this rationale, there have been a surge of women-centered clean energy access programs in recent years. We are going to hear some extraordinary examples of these today. But what are the impacts? How are the results being measured? That's what we're going to focus on in quite a bit more detail through the presentations of this webinar. The key is data collection and strengthening monitoring and evaluation systems. Without data, we know that the barriers and transformations that women are experiencing in their daily lives simply are invisible. At a moment when the international community has agreed to work towards achieving new development pathways through the pursuit of the SDGs, with the goal of achieving universal access to modern energy sources and gender equality by 2030, and the generation of social, environmental, and economic co-benefits from mitigation initiatives, it becomes imperative to understand how progress in the energy sector can address gender equality, can advance gender equality, in this case through the implementation of women-centered clean energy projects. So our framing questions to shape this webinar today are why is it so important to address data collection as an integral part of the Project m and &E cycle for women's economic empowerment programs and projects, and what can we learn from it? What new innovative New or innovative technologies are currently being used for data collection and analysis, and how so? And what are the advantages and barriers of using new data and technologies? And how do these data collection technologies perform in the field? We have some very exciting examples ahead of us. We are going to have four speakers from three uh, organizations, extraordinary organizations. First, Lucia Fort from SMAP World Bank Group, specifically from the Afrea Gender and Energy Program. We'll be talking about strengthening M&E systems through gender responsive analysis, tracking impact technologies and their integration into M&E systems. Um, will be discussed by Tomohiro Hamakawa and Lana Cristanto from Copernic. And then Abby McKay from Solar Sister will discuss tracking gender indicators in clean energy projects. And then again, we'll be reserving as much time as we can for questions and answers. Each of the presentations will be 10 to 12 minutes, so we hope to have adequate time at the end. Oops. Finally, excuse me, finally, uh, reiterating again that Gecko Energy is an open initiative, and it works because of the participation of all of you and all of our colleagues. So here's the address for the green platform at the bottom of the screen, and the contact information for all of my colleagues online, Ana Rojas being our energy task manager. And again, thank you for joining us, and my name is Kate Warren. I would then like to turn over to Lucia Fort as our as our first speaker this morning. 
Lucia is a gender and social development specialist with over 17 years of operational experience integrating gender considerations in international development projects and in infrastructure, agriculture, rural development, education, micro and entrepreneurship, and social development. She has extensive analytical and project monitoring and evaluation skills and experience, including in integrating sex disaggregated and gender relevant indicators into m and &E systems and tracking and assessing results by gender. She is currently working with the Afrea Gender and Energy Team at the World Bank. And Dr. Ford comes from Peru and holds a PhD in sociology from American University. Lucia, if you are all set, then the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Kate, and thank you to everyone for uh, participating in this, uh, what I think is a very interesting session. Um, let me tell you a little bit about the Afrea Gender and Energy Program and the work the World Bank is doing to integrate gender considerations into energy operations. We all know that uh, the energy sector is, is one where there has been, uh, in, the, in, in, in general, little integration of gender. Uh, it's a hard, it's called a hard sector, uh, sector uh, part of infrastructure. And that's one of the reasons why we're doing this, to trying to do this from the uh, World Bank. Um, the Free Gender and Energy Program is actually a program within SMAP. Uh, that really is focusing on how to integrate gender considerations into energy projects in the Africa region. <clears throat> AFREA means um, Africa um, access to uh, uh, renewable energy and access program. So um, uh, with that, uh, oh, and in my case, uh, just to tell you that at this point, I'm uh, work with the AFREA team, particularly in how to uh, find and use data to improve the projects, to inform the monitoring and evaluation, and then how to um, ensure that the monitoring and evaluation at the project level also takes into account gender differences. Now, with that introduction, uh, I'm going to start uh, my, my presentation. Now, I wonder if everything is going well. Um, why is it that it's, I'm going, I'm trying to get to my previous email, uh, previous um, um, slide. Oh, sorry. Uh, I'm going to need some help. It's no problem, Lucia. Maggie, I'm sure, is going to send you a note of support. No, I think I found it. I think I found it. Yes. Great. Okay. So why is, why is, is gender responsive data important? Uh, how does it contribute to a better integration of uh, gender considerations in development projects? Well, many reasons, but I think one that is very important uh, it's that, you know, if we have what's called hard data, evidence, then we can convince the decision makers about the importance and the need for a gender respons responsive approach. And in the case of the energy sector, we frequently hear there's no data, there's no evidence. Well, there are more data and evidence than they know, and even than we know, that we can use to leverage this uh, data and use it to convince them that it's important to integrate gender. Uh, the second reason I think is uh, when you have data, uh, and I mean data uh, before you start a project, it lets you understand who your client, who your beneficiaries are, uh, what are their, the, uh, the differences they have in access, in use, in needs uh, by gender. So that's also important. It, it can help you choose which relevant actions, gender relevant actions and targets to adopt. And this can inform the project design and implementation, including the project development objectives and the intermediate results indicators that we use in the monitoring of the project. And frequently it can provide a baseline for setting project benchmarks, many targets and indicators. So 
it, it, that's why it's so important that we have data. Now, why is gender sensitive m &E monitoring and evaluation important? Well, we all know what is not counted does not count. Uh, I would say, just to summarize, two issues. One has to do with accountability. Uh, monitoring progress helps ensure the work on gender is carried out. Unless we have a way of uh, tracking uh, and reporting what is being done in terms of gender, the gender-relevant actions or gender-responsive programs, uh, and we can say it's being done, it's not being done, it's being done well. Unless we have that, there's no way we can uh, make uh, project implementers, uh, decision makers, accountable. Um, so that's one uh, one reason. And the other re reason it's important is that as we uh, implement a project, as we go in the field and as we do take out the actions, do the actions and whatever, um, we need to know what's going on. We need to know what's going on on the ground. And that's where monitoring comes in uh, and, you know, monitoring regularly. And finally, um, when we can assess their project impacts, uh, on women and men and how that has changed the gender relations and, and gender inequality, that also provides lessons and good practices that can inform future projects. Now, just in general, how does gender responsive data enhance gender sensitive m and &E? And this is, I'm just going to go very quickly over this. It's sort of a summary of what I've just said. Uh, these are things you could use actually if you're trying to uh, convince the decision makers, particularly those who uh, have to assign uh, either staff or funding to integrate gender into the monitoring and evaluation um, um, of, of a project. Well, it informs the project design. It helps choose the key gender actions to adopt. Uh, and this is, this is very, very important because basically many times the decision makers at the project level are thinking that it's not just a question of okay, do let's do something for women, let's do let's have an action for women, and that's not what we want. We want to respond to what the gender needs are, and that comes from having data that will inform that. Then it can provide a baseline uh, for setting the benchmarks. Again, an issue with a. a um, uh, m and &E systems and, and, and people who are working in them, um, it can help uh, make the case for why it's important to adopt gender-relevant targets and indicators among the m and &E staff. Again, usually if you have m and &E staff, they want, they want data, they want to know what's going on, and they want numbers. Uh, and that, that comes out of having gender-responsive data. And finally, it makes it possible to measure and assess the progress and the impact on women and men uh, of the project. Um, so with that, oh, before I move into how do we get data, which is basically what I'm going to be covering mostly in this, in this presentation, let's just go over what are the key constraints to integrate in gender into project m and &E. And the first one is lack of gender responsive data that is sex is segregated and gender relevant data or poor quality make it difficult to make the case for gender it's not just a question of there's no data or whatever but the data may not be good now one big constraint that we have is at least in my in my experience is that project m and &E in general is not very good uh it it may be something that in the case of the World Bank, when we make the loans, the uh, government or the implementing agency within the government or even the contractors are the ones who are responsible for carrying out setting up and carrying out monitoring and evaluation. And frequently, they are not uh, very skilled at doing this. So part of the work we'll need to do is work with them to improve the project m and &E in general in order to then say, okay, now, if you're going to be doing this, this is how you do, uh, how you pay attention to gender differences. Of course, there's the issue of the added cost, um, where, you know, we need to take into account gender differences and adopt activities to collect data from women. And we all know that collecting data from women is not the same as collecting data from men in terms of timing, in terms of access, in terms of even language. 
it may, we, we may need to do more to be able to collect data from women. And then, of course, there's a lack of expertise. And that refers mostly to the um, staff who are doing the monitoring. Uh, and again, it may require uh, hiring a consultant or working with them to train them so that they can do this and they can understand what they're doing. OK, so how do we get gender responsive data? And I'm going to really cover uh, four ways in which we can get gender responsive data ahead of uh, a project being implemented. We're talking at this point, for the most part, when the project is designed and prepared before it goes in the field, because you need the data then to be able to uh, sort of inform the whole monitoring and evaluation. If you don't know where you're starting from, there's no way that you can get or you know if you're getting to where you want to go. So uh, I've found in the work we're doing that there are actually four sort of easy or easier ways in which we can get uh, available data sources and databases and, and mining. Now, bear in mind that there are very little data on gender and energy. Uh, that is data that is usually not con not collected in a way. I mean, we have anecdotic data. data. We have uh, a lot. We may have quantitative qualitative studies. We may even have um, studies of one project or another project. But what we would call sort of national level um, statistical data uh, on uh, gender and energy or on energy by gender or by sex are not usually available. So, but still, it is the easiest way to get data. And where do we get this data? This data typically comes from surveys, sometimes from censuses. Surveys that may be collected by the National Statistical Office in the country or uh, commissioned by outside uh, funders. Uh, and then it's, it's also then uh, available in many cases from those who have commissioned it. Uh, it may be the National Statistical Office may have it uh, because they have an agreement with whoever has funded it or they have a policy of making the data. And I'm, by data in this case, I'm talking about not publications, not reports, but databases and data sets. So they may have an agreement to make this available and that's how you get it. The data um, can, can usually reports demographic characteristics, sex, age, composition of the household, poverty, income and expenditures, rural urban locations, time use, gender roles, and even assets disaggregated by sex, all of which are important when we're trying to understand the different way in which women and men use energy and their different needs and constraints. Uh, where do you find this data? Well, the World Bank has an open data a policy and an, an open data, a repository of the data, the data sets and databases for uh, the surveys that it uh, that it uh, helps fund. And so that is a good place. The national statistical offices, depending on whether they make their data available or not, the UN agencies also, the ones that are in charge of different uh, like health or education surveys, other data collect collectors, such as uh, the USAID that collects the demographic and health surveys, or the UN, again, that collects the mix, and in some cases from researchers. Now, I, to give you an example of, of how we would use this in the, in the bank, there's the, uh, in the case of Tanzania, for a rural electrification expansion project, we found uh, that we use the data from a national panel survey uh, as baseline for the project. Now, the, the survey found that there, and this is actually rural electrification, keep this in mind. It found that, that the, there was no difference in connection rates between female and male headed households in rural areas. However, it found an important difference in urban areas where, you know, a lot, where many more households had been connected. And doing a further analysis by income level, uh, found that um, only a small proportion of rural households had received connections, and those were in the higher income levels. In other words, it seemed that both female and male-headed households had the money 
the resources to get a connection. And that may explain why, why there was no gender differences. So what is to be expected is that a difference between female and, uh, female and male-headed um, and male-headed households will emerge as more households are connected. Now, another way of uh, getting this, the data we need is by integrating gender into other data collection processes, such as censuses, household or business surveys. The problems with this it may be that they can be costly and make the survey too long. In other words, if we're trying to integrate questions or even a module on gender or on energy, uh, this may make uh, the, the survey that is being collected, let's say it's a living standards measurement survey or it's a household expenditure type of survey or even a demographic and health survey, the, it may be too, too heavy, too long. Uh, so one has to be strategic in which questions and how to do this integration. Um, in both areas, both the information by sex or sex relevant questions or uh, putting questions on energy use. However, however, yeah, uh, many me, of them, yeah. excuse me? I'm sorry to interrupt you. I just wanted to give you a bit of a time check. If you can try to wrap up in the next couple of minutes, that would be fantastic. Oh, sorry, I'm going to. No, no, I'm, it's fine. Oh, it's wonderful. I hate to jump in. <laughs> go ahead, please. The good thing is, I'll go a little bit faster, but the good thing is that you will get uh, access to this presentation. So, uh, examples, the uh, Living Standard Measurement Survey or the Ethiopia Rural Socioeconomic Survey, which is being used as a baseline for a, a, a project and which uh, is giving, is going to give, because we've worked with them, some information on gender uh, and on, on using um, uh, on energy. Then we have a new, a new instrument that has been developed by the World Bank uh, in, a, in a response to a request from the Sustainable uh, Energy for All, uh, and that is how to measure access uh, in, a, in a sort of meaningful way, and this is called a multi-tier framework for measuring energy access. And these surveys are being conducted by the World Bank now, or are being started in uh, about uh, 14, 15 countries, those that have the, the lowest uh, proportions of households connected to the energy grid uh, and one example is the Niger M uh, MTF survey which we are working with where there'll be uh, over sampling to connect more information on the on urban areas and then of course we have other countries. The problem with this is timing uh, in, in the sense that yes we will have the data but we don't have it now for projects that we're already working on. Now the best one would be the project baseline survey but at this point, we find a few projects currently conduct baseline surveys. They may be too costly, they may require technical expertise, or they may take too long. However, we do have examples of projects that have done this in Tanzania, in Senegal, in Benin. And in some cases, this happens because what they're doing, actually, we are basing, instead of collecting a baseline survey, what we have is a survey or an assessment that has been carried Ahead, of, ahead at the end of, of a previous uh, uh, stage of projects. Let's say the project number one was, was done, finished, and so project number two doing the same thing comes in, but there has been an evaluation or an assessment, and you can get data that can serve as baseline data. Uh, it's not perfect, but it can, it can work. Um, now, I'm, I'm skipping this about the benefits of using the MTF approach. Um, I will give, um, um, I haven't put it here, but I will give the source of where you can learn more about this uh, because it's going to be done in every country where the, the bank works. And you can um, then find this out for yourself. You can contact me about it. And just one thing, the data will not be useful unless you do some gender analysis. Uh, when we get publications that tell us, okay, the proportion of households is the, the, the you know, female headed head, head household is, versus male-headed households, they are really not doing gender analysis. They're just giving you points, data points. The gender analysis, you have to use the databases of the data sets that you have and create your own analysis, where you relate uh, all the demographic and social characteristics, and economic characteristics, to gender, to gender and also to energy use. Uh, so the best data, 
would be to have data, the best would be to have data about the target population and the area where a project is going to work. But that is hard to do. Uh, uh, but if you have it, you can have it through the, the baseline survey. And the analysis doesn't have to be too complex. Now, bear in mind that gender analysis requires time, expertise, and funding. Uh, so many times it's hard to do it. And some final considerations. Uh, timing and resources seem to be the major problems to getting adequate data. So get involved early in the project process and consider preparing a short sort of a gender and energy access profile for each country where you work that can be used for future projects. Um, and then get, again, the last one, get involved early with a project staff to ensure they understand the importance of gender and they know how to do it. Uh, it may require capacity building and technical assistance throughout the project implementation. And that is the end. Uh, I'm sorry if I had to rush. I, I realize I thought it would take le less time. And I'm ready for any questions. And thank you. Fantastic, Lucia. Thank you so much for that. As we're switching screens here, um, and getting set up for the next presentation, I thought I would remind you to please do send your questions in. Already a few have really interesting questions have come in for you, Lucia. One about um, especially different, sharing different perspectives from different actors in the sector. For example, the for-profit companies and non-state actors who are so dominant in the sector, um, and they think of households as their clients, not individuals. So how do they respond to the initiatives, to the call for this kind of sex disaggregated uh, data at the outset? And another question is you focused a lot on the importance of, of course, setting this stage, collecting the data, doing the analysis at the design stage. But what happens if you're halfway through a project and realize you've missed the opportunity? maybe some insights into um, what to do midway through. Um, so with that, I think we're getting the next presentation up. And so it is my pleasure. Thank you very much, Lucia. That was a fantastic presentation. Um, we have two extraordinary speakers from Copernic up next. Um, I'm going to give very brief bios, but they deserve much, much more extensive bios because of their extraordinary experience. Uh, Tomohiro Hamakawa Tomo is the Chief Strategy Officer at Copernic. He's a seasoned development professional having lived and worked in various corners of the world, from the Tibetan Plateau to the Indian drylands to the Indonesian tropics to the Japanese metropolises. He has extensive field experience working for international and local development NGOs across Asia and Africa. And one of my favorite lines of the bio, he was recognized as one of 51 unsung heroes of Com passion in 2014 by His Holiness of the Dalai Lama. Tomo is joined by the m &E officer at Copernic, a Jakarta native, Lana Cristanto. Lana has an extensive background in music, psychology, and economics from Wesleyan University and Maastricht University. And as an m &E officer at Copernic, she focuses on designing the methodology for and implementing the impact assessment of the Wonder Women Eastern Indonesia program, an incredible program that I know a little bit about, and I'm excited to learn more. So Tomo and Lana, thank you so much for joining us, and the floor is yours. And I'll ask you to just keep a little bit of a peek at the clock. We're running a couple minutes over, so if you can try to stick to 10 or 12 minutes, we will be right on track. Thank you so much. Hi, uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Lana and I uh, are really excited to share with you a little bit about Copernic and the, the, and the work that we've done in the ITT catalog and the tools. So Copernic is a Indonesia-based social enterprise that connects simple, uh, life-changing technology with last mile communities to reduce poverty. And we wanted to cover three things uh, today. Uh, one is a quick overview of the impact tracker technology catalog, the ITT catalog. And then I'll pass it on to Lana, who will talk about the one, uh, Wonder Woman program and how we use the ITT tools in the Wonder Woman program. So the um, ITT catalog, in a nutshell, connects demand and supply 
for ICT tools in international development. And um, we really wanted to connect uh, those two things uh, through what we call the Impact Tracker Technology Catalog. And the research behind this catalog was conducted two years ago and was funded by the Rockefeller Foundation as part of the Impact Economy Innovation Fund. The origin of this research is that as a distributor of clean energy technology, we, Copernic, wanted to navigate this seemingly complex ict for d sector and decided to openly publish our research because we thought other organizations must be facing similar situations. And since launching the catalog, we received very positive feedback and wanted to share a little bit about that today. Um, as you, if you see the, if you, you can access the, the ITT catalog from the link at the bottom of this slide. Um, hopefully it's a uh, user-friendly website. Um, and it was launched in uh, October 2014, so two years ago and has been updated twice, including an update just a few weeks ago. So the main question that drove this research is this question. What if nonprofits and social enterprises were able to report real-time, large-scale data on their social impact in an affordable way? Because what's happening in most organizations is that data is collecting in an outdated way and in a small scale way and in a very expensive fashion. So we want to change that. And this catalog features 47 tools in total um, across five categories. And the first two categories um, are quite competitive, um, as you'll see in, in the next couple of slides. Uh, they feature actually more than a dozen uh, tools. So we wanted to give some sort of rating uh, to the tools in the first two categories so that we don't just give a laundry list of tools to, to readers and that would actually be more confusing um, for uh, people who want to use these tools. So I'll quickly go through each category one by one. Uh, the first category is what we call digital data collection apps. And I'm sure a lot of you have seen this kind of tool um, on tablets or smartphones. It's basically a way to collect data in a paperless way. And in this um, catalog, uh, in this category, uh, we have about 14 tools, uh, including Comcare, Magpie, Service ETO, iPhone Builder, and TerraWorks um, uh, being the top um, recommendations in this category. The second category is what we call the mobile communication technology platforms. It's really a way for organizations to uh, send uh, uh, SMS blasts or to use IVR um, features, so voice calling, um, to clients. And in this, in this category, we also have al almost a dozen tools uh, with Tellervit and Tellervit Textit and Engage Spark uh, at the top of the recommendation. And the third category is geospatial mapping tools. And uh, this is a pretty self-explanatory category. Uh, and Ushahidi uh, is probably the, well, uh, the most well-known tool in this category. The fourth category, remote sensors, is, is, is my favorite, actually. <laughs> uh, even though it's probably the most, most immature uh, in terms of commercial availability, uh, it holds tremendous potential to transform the way m and &E, uh, will be done in the future. Uh, I think it's a true disruptor uh, in this space of um, uh, monitoring and evaluation in international development. Uh, we feature 12 remote sensors in this category and they do, they measure different things and so we group them by, by its use. So it's, uh, monitoring stoves, water quality, air quality, infrastructure, storage, and rainforest. And the last one, fifth category, fifth category is data analysis and visualization tools. This is actually the, the um, most recent addition um, to the catalog um, that was added uh, just a few weeks ago. Um, this is a way for organizations to analyze data and to visualize data uh, once collected um, from, from the field. So I'll pass it on to Lana, uh, who will talk a little bit more about how we use these, um, these tools in our program. Hi, thank you, Tomo. 
Now I'm going to tell a bit about how we implement digital data collection in our gender and energy access program, which is called the Wonder Women Indonesia. So it started from efforts to provide people in remote areas access to cleaner energy sources for getting drinking water, lighting, and cooking. And we do this by creating micro-business opportunities for local women who we call the Wonder Women, or Ibu Inspirasi in Indonesian. And the results so far, we have about 516 women in our network who have altogether distributed more than 22,000 technologies. And this program is supported by a grant from Energia, the International Network on Gender and Sustainable Energy, and also other funding partners. So I have uh, some extra slides here, and we'll let you know, uh, and we'll let you read more about the program in the handout, or you can visit also our website listed here. Um, so. We expected a few outcomes from this program. The first one is Wonder Woman Empowerment, and the second is Life Improvement for Technology Users. And we measure this mainly by conducting household surveys. And this is the empowerment journey. So the recruited women get trainings, and then they start promoting and selling technologies, um, earning a margin on each sale. And then they expand their business and became more influential agents of change in their communities. So um, we expect our women to follow these three stages as they progress in the program, the personal, household, and then the community level of impact. And our m &E tools and activities also follow this journey. So baseline surveys, training, um, tests, and communications, and monthly monitoring, and also follow-up surveys. And um, from each sphere or each stage, we derive some indicators for assessment. The closer it is to the personal sphere, the more we can say that it is a direct impact of our program. And we look at things such as increasing income, confidence level, stake in household decision making, and if they eventually create employment for other people, etc. For the technology users, we measure how much the technology is adopted and whether these technologies can cut their spending and fuel use, um, health improvement as a result of using cleaner alternatives to fossil fuel, and also productivity boost. Again, we'll distribute these slides as a handout, so you can read more closely later. But right now, I'm going to explain the 3W and 1H of Copernic's digital data collection and share our experiences. So Indonesia is a set of 17,000 islands. And this is a map of our Wonder Woman areas. As, and as you can tell, it comes with a lot of challenges, not just for logistics, but also for our monitoring. Um, cell phone signal could be very sparse. And at the bottom left here, you can see the road from one project area to another. Um, it's not the most pleasant road. So we do hundreds of household interviews simply because uh, it's the only way we could gather all the information that we needed. Um, so, and finally, I think we need a quick, consistent, and reliable system to collect data from all these areas so we can report and we can meet decisions more quickly. And because of this, we have completely switched to digital surveys from paper-based surveys. Uh, here we outline the advantages and disadvantages of both. Um, in short, paper is better when you have smaller scale surveys and if you need to get your tool out quickly. But it comes with risks of losing data, and it takes a while to digitize. So it's probably not very good for our scale. Um, digital data, on the other hand, is very helpful in large-scale collection. And the data analyst can access the data much quicker already in digitized form. But we needed to invest in training the enumerators and in the hardware and the software that we need. So, but which one should we use, right? Um, as Tomo had mentioned earlier, with the catalog, many solutions have been developed for this purpose. And some are more sophisticated than the others. And some are more user-friendly all on opposite ends. So what tool should you use really depends on what type of assessment you're doing and how much resource do you want to invest. So in the past year, we have been using an app called Comcare. And this is just an example of how the interface looks like with the survey that we have built. So click, click, and you go to the next um, question or the next um, data that you need to answer. 
And also, um, we like it because it's a very uh, user-friendly uh, application, and he has it comes with a case management function. So each respondent is a case, and her data from all different surveys in different times can feed into your current survey with her, and they're all saved in one case, which is very good for data management. And it also captures GPS coordinates, photos, signatures, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we can also digitize, for example, constant letters and take digital signatures. All right. So who are involved in Copernic? That's three teams. Um, because Comcare has a relatively complicated building process, we get a lot of help from our IT team. And because of the widespread project areas, we also train everyone in the program team and field teams to be able to do digital surveys. And finally, operational consideration. Um, obviously, some things apply whether you use paper or tablet. For example, make sure if you're interviewing a housewife that she's by herself because the presence of her husband or neighbor can influence her answer. But these are things to pay attention to specifically when you're shifting to digital data collection. Um, first, you need to make sure you develop a technical guide in addition to a survey guide for your intermediaries, and you need to train them well in using the devices and apps. And second, you need to pilot the test surveys before rolling it out. And third, you need to have a backup plan in case of technological failures. And finally, uh, make sure you have a quick feedback loop between the people who develop the surveys and the ones who are actually using it. And that's all from Copernic. Thank you. And we welcome any questions you may have. Wow, fantastic. What an interesting presentation. I think there will be a lot of questions. So I will take that opportunity to remind you to send your questions via the question function in the control panel. I, I think that we've had a few new participants join over the last couple of minutes. So a warm welcome to any newcomers. We're about to segue to our last official presentation of the webinar. And then we'll spend some time on questions and discussion. I will also remind all of you, and especially the newcomers, that this webinar is being recorded, and the recording as well as all of the presentations will be available on our website, genderandenvironment.org slash energy. So with that, a very short, for the sake of time, again, Abby deserves a much longer introduction than this, but it is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Abby McKay, who is the Grants and Impact Manager for Solar Sister, who I'm sure we all know, the only organization in the world formed with the exclusive mission to build an Africa-wide network of women clean energy entrepreneurs to address extreme energy poverty. Before joining Solar Sister, Abigail worked with the policy and gender team of Power Africa at USAID. She devoted a large portion of her time to integrating gender mechanisms and frameworks into the structure of that initiative. So with that, Abby, take it away. Thank you so much. And my bio seems much less cool, followed by someone who's been honored by the Dalai Lama. Um, <laughs> but thank you so much. And uh, my name is Abby Mackey. I'm Solar Sisters Grants and Impact Manager, and I think Copernic's presentation was such a great setup for what I'll do is take a couple of the tools, tools that they described in their presentation and really deep dive into Solar Sister has adopted those tools for our model. So most of you may be familiar with Solar Sister or not. I'll give just a really quick background on who we are. Solar Sister was formed to really address two key issues. One is that most of the energy sector development is happening in urban centers, and those living in the last mile and in rural communities are really being left out of the picture. And there's a huge gap between where products are being made and if those clean energy products are being distributed to that last mile. Solar Sister was also formed to provide women with an economic, clean energy-driven opportunity. Uh, they're often overlooked when it comes to clean energy development, and Solar Sister really wants to directly integrate them into last mile clean energy distribution. So what we do, is my slide, can you see the slide moving? I just want to double check. Yes, everything looks great so great. far. <laughs> Thanks. So what we do is we recruit, train, and support women to run independent solar and clean cooking solutions. And the majority of our sales come from those small solar lanterns, but we do offer a variety of products when it comes to small solar lanterns, the mobile solar chargers, and then the more large-scale systems. 
So since starting out in Uganda in 2010 with just five entrepreneurs, we've scaled our network to over 2,600 entrepreneurs who are in Uganda, Nigeria, and Tanzania who have brought clean energy access to over 700,000 people. So as we've grown as an organization, our m and &E needs have grown. And as our first presenter mentioned that to get and catalyze investment, you really need data to back that up. And we also at Solar Sister want to be leaders in this nexus of gender and energy and getting data that proves that this is a smart investment to make, is empowering women in the clean energy sector. So I think as many organizations, we started off with paper surveys, basic Excel documents when it came to tracking our impact. And that worked for a couple of years. And then we realized that we really needed to scale these systems to meet our growth and the impact that we wanted to have. So I think this slide is really important in terms of laying out the needs that we had at the time that we were looking at this a couple years ago because the systems that you choose are really based on the organization that you're in and the specific needs you have. So because of these needs, that's why we chose the systems that I'll go through. So our top priorities were first, um, a very easy system to use by our distributed field staff team. Most of our staff is going out every day. They're interviewing entrepreneurs in villages that don't have access to electricity or the internet. And so we needed something simple that they could use and understand in the field to gather data on. We also wanted to change over to a completely paperless operation system. And as you know, I mean, that's very, that's less resource intensive. First of all, as a sustainable energy organization, we want to be environmentally friendly, but it's also a much more efficient system. Paper surveys get lost, it takes a while to input that data into the computer. So we wanted something that was more efficient. And we also wanted to increase and diversify the type of data that we were able to capture. And finally, we wanted this system to fit our dual purpose as a social enterprise, which is the operation side of gathering invoices, monitoring inventory, everything that comes with being the, a clean energy business, but also on the women's empowerment side and this impact tracking and looking at things like changes in income and decision-making power among our women entrepreneurs. And we wanted one system that could satisfy all, the need, all these needs. So the first system we adopted was a data management system. I'm sure many of you are familiar with Salesforce. So this system is a cloud storage and data management software. Um, it has probably thousands of functions, so I won't go through everything it can do. But what it's been great for us is that it manages our data and allows us to, to graph that data out to fit the results that we're looking to achieve. So for example, every single one of our field staff has what we call a Salesforce dashboard, which is a series of eight to 10 different graphs that model the data that they're inputting into the system and showing them, are you meeting your recruits for this month of Solar Sister Entrepreneurs? Or are you meeting your sales goals? And it allows us to look at a variety of different factors. So a couple of the graphs here are just examples of what we're able to look at in our data. So we can look at the types of products that we're selling, where are they being sold over time, are we increasing the number of units that we're selling, and then also are we increasing our recruits every month? This is staying consistent. So Salesforce has really allowed us to line up this data with our needs. And it's also great, um, as the grants manager, each and every one of our grants has its own Salesforce dashboard. So we're able to look at all of the data that we have in the ways that we need to look at it. Are we meeting the goals of this grant? Are we meeting the goals of our organization? But Salesforce still left us with those paper surveys that we had. And as Copernic mentioned, TerraWorks is a great software. Um, it's one of those options you can choose. And we chose TerraWorks because it's specifically designed for remote field operations. TerraWorks is a tablet-based software that basically has preloaded digital forms that you create that can be filled out. And TerraWorks is so great because it can be used without access to the internet. Our field staff, and someone is pictured here in Tanzania, that's Ancilla, you can take data on that tablet, and then once that field staff member gets access to the internet, that can be uploaded. All of that data is directly linked up to Salesforce, and it's uploaded and can be monitored at our headquarters, whether that's a week later or a month later that you're getting back on that internet. And so TerraWorks is really, really great for getting rid of our paper surveys, having a very easy to use tablet-based monitoring evaluation software that our field staff could take their tablet out and work with our entrepreneurs in the community. 
Skyworks also allowed us to expand the type of data that we were capturing. So for example, we can now get the GPS coordinates at the time that an entrepreneur signs up to be a part of Solar Sisters Network. And you can also see Hannah here in Uganda. We can now get photographs of our entrepreneurs. They love taking the selfies. Um, and we can also get digital signatures now that we've transitioned to this tablet-based system. So overall, what we've done with these two systems, Salesforce and TerraWorks, is we've built a monitoring evaluation tracking system that focuses on the individual entrepreneur level. And it looks at tracking her real-time business growth, her sales. If an entrepreneur makes a sale in one day, within a day, we already see that sale on our Salesforce system because it's been inputted through TerraWorks. And so it's able to look at the growth of her system and our operational changes, but it can also look at our Improving Livelihoods Indices, which was developed with the support of the International Center for Research on Women. And this is more of our women's empowerment impact tracking. And so what we do is we take a baseline survey through TerraWorks at the time that an entrepreneur signs up, and then at the end of the year we're doing our endline surveys to see changes in that woman's empowerment and her improvement in her livelihoods. And so Overall, back to the point of, you know, we really monitor at the individual entrepreneur level. We take a bit of a different approach, I would say, than many organizations. We don't do sample sizes. Uh, we're really, if I wanted to know what one specific entrepreneur's sales were for this month, we're able to do that for every single entrepreneur, and we can track the, her changes. And so some of the data that we've been able to capture through these systems um, I'll lay out here just a couple points. So one of them is, of course, as a women's enterprise organization, we want to look at changes in income. And what we've been able to find monitoring the sales of our entrepreneurs and their initial income levels is that, on average, our entrepreneurs are able to increase their income by 15 to 20 percent. We can also verify that we're meeting our mission's main purpose and goals. Because we're able to track the locations of our entrepreneurs, we found that 90% of our Solar Sister entrepreneurs live in those rural communities, which are our target population. So we know we're meeting that last mile need. Those entrepreneurs are living in those communities and they're selling those products to their neighbors. We can also get feedback from our entrepreneurs about their satisfaction with our business model and the support that we provide. And so this graph shows what the benefits were that were cited by entrepreneurs at the end of last year in East Africa. And the majority of them said that the income and the personal benefits of having the products were the top benefit. And then they talked about the quality of products and the skills development opportunities. We can also look at the other piece of our model, which is the clean energy access piece. Uh, for example, our entrepreneurs were able to decrease their time spent on fuel wood collection by 62%, and we knew that by taking the baseline value and looking at the end of year values through TerraWorks and seeing how those had changed. We can also look at kerosene savings and savings on mobile charging as well. So on average, we found that our entrepreneurs were able to decrease their energy costs by $200 per year. So when you're adopting any type of system, I mean, there's going to be trade-offs and there's going to be challenges. And so a couple of the challenges that we face with TerraWorks and Salesforce is just the expenses, of course. When you're adopting some sort of software, there's going to be a monthly or an annual fee that you have to pay. And the other big piece of this is training. It takes a lot of additional training to get someone taught on how to use these systems. And you know we're constantly getting questions, and I'm getting this error message. So it's really about investing in training early on and making sure that they know how to use those systems. Because we have a remote and distributed field staff team. And so they're not sitting in an office on a laptop. They're out there. They're using the tablets, and they have to know how to use them. And then, of course, uh, there's gaps in the data you're going to be able to capture. For example, health data. We're limited on the amount of health data we can capture. And also, as I mentioned, our systems revolve around that woman entrepreneur herself. So we're not getting the customer level data that that entrepreneur is selling to that customer because she's running an independent business. So really quick, just to go through a couple of the things that we're doing to address some of these gaps is we're partnering with many universities. Uh, last summer we had Santa Clara University come in and do our first ever large scale customer level survey where they came in and they interviewed customers in person. And so this is really great, not just so we can increase the data that we're capturing that goes beyond our field staff that are capturing the data, but it also is great for third party verification. Our, is the data that we're tracking lining up with what other people are gonna come in and see? And then another huge partnership that we've had is with the International Center for Research on Women. And they did a more qualitative assessment, looking at indicators that were much more difficult for our field staff to gather. Things like respect from an entrepreneur's families as a result of working with Solar Sister, or financial independence, or mobility and status in a community, which is not 
those factors are not easy to get to in a survey, and you can't really get to them in a standard survey like we do with our field staff. So we really wanted to come in and be able to expand the type of data we were looking at. And then just my last slide looking forward, things that we're looking at at Solar Sister that I think many other organizations are considering is interactive voice response approaches, uh, the IVR approaches, and looking at um, because SMS probably won't work with our, population, our target population and our target audience because they're illiterate for the most part, how do we do an IVR system that could gather data? And then a randomized control trial for more, a more systematic and rigorous evaluation. And then finally, we're also looking for ways that we can include our own entrepreneurs in data collection. Is there a way that they can work with us and get that customer level data? So I believe that's it. And I wanted to thank Energia, who has been a huge a supporter of Solar Sister for so long, and it has really helped us scale our monitoring evaluation systems. And my contact information is here, and as is Solar Sister's website, where you can learn more and look up that qualitative assessment that I talked about with ICRW. It's posted on our website. So thank you. Wonderful, Abby. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, Great. Thank you all for those incredible presentations. We have questions flooding in now. I'm trying to organize them quickly. Uh, we have about 20 minutes left, so I think we have some time to tackle quite a number of these questions coming in. And, and please, for those of you who haven't, feel free to keep on sending them in. Um, we will, the last thing I will do at this webinar is ask each of our wonderful speakers for a key takeaway message. So start thinking about those and then hold your brilliant takeaway thoughts for just a moment. I think we're going to categorize the questions and go back to Lucia first. Um, Lucia, there have been some questions. If you could share, for example, some great examples of gender analysis and how that has been actually um, implemented then in a, in a given project. I mentioned already a, a question that I think is a really interesting one that may not be quite as relevant for the other speakers, but with particular attention to the fact that the energy sector is so dominated by, you know, quote unquote, technical, non-state, um, for profit actors, how does this call for sex disaggregated, gender responsive information resonate? What kinds of challenges have you been faced with and, and how do you make that sell, if you will, for lack of a better word, when in fact these companies are looking at a household or a business as a client and don't really care who, who among those um, are there. And then the last question is, is for all the speakers, but I think it might be most re relevant for you, Lucia, and then others are very welcome to chime in. How do you entrench um, the idea that this sex, this need and this use of sex disaggregated gender responsive information it needs to be affected throughout the project cycle and is not just a one-time effort or, to put it in my own words, a, a little box to tick at the beginning of an initiative. Lucia, would you mind spending a, a couple minutes tackling any or all of those questions? Right. Um, the first one, the one on gender analysis, I. Um, but the only thing I can refer you to, I mean, is that uh, in, in the, what the bank has done is there is a gender innovation lab, uh, which works for several regions and particularly in Africa. And what they have been doing is impact evaluations. And that's where they've done more gender analysis. Um, it's at this point not my, my strength. So I will just pass on that. Uh, on... Uh, um, how to how to overcome the problem of the household level, and it is true, uh, electricity or energy connections are done at the level of the household, and that is not just private sector. Everybody, when they do a connection, uh, you know, they connect the household, and who is in the household um, is not of interest. It's inter the interest is connecting households. Uh, ways of of getting around it, well. Uh, the uh, energy modules or even the, the MTF surveys are collecting information about the household members by uh, sex, by age, and also 
their needs, for, uh, or their energy needs, and how they use energy, and what are they doing with their time. So that's one way of doing it. However, this is done usually at the beginning of the project. How do you do it uh, halfway or as the project is developed is much more complicated uh, uh, because it requires uh, the project to um, assign resources to do this. Now, uh, that goes to your third question. Uh, projects typically uh, have a midterm review uh, or assessment that is done uh, halfway through the implementation. Uh, and many times what they have is an impact assessment or some kind of evaluation than this, then you could work with the project team to ensure that, you know, that that includes gender and that includes not just household level, but also within the household information, co data collection. I don't see a, a development project having a continuous, continuous sort of uh, uh, tracking and assessing that is very, I don't see that happening. Uh, this is not what I've seen in any development projects, to tell you the truth. But I can see it at the beginning, I can see it in the middle, and I can see it at the completion. Uh, and how to entrench it? Well, that's a big question. I've been working on this for 17 years, and I still haven't gotten it entrenched. And, and the part of the problem is that m and &E itself is not entrenched in development projects. So it's hard to make the case for engendered m and &E, when M&E it does not get the importance it's, or the funding it should get. And that's it. That's great, Lucia. Thank you. And and darn, I hope you are going to solve the, the mystery for us about how to entrench a fully gender responsive uh, approach throughout the project cycle. I, I think many of us uh, grapple with that very question. Well, it, it is a question of working continuously throughout the project implementation providing sure. technical assistance and working through all the project implementation and particularly anytime there is some kind of monitoring you know coming back and saying do it this way uh, and the impact evaluations have helped uh, that are done at the completion of projects they have helped uh, make the case so that that is also a good thing that's great. Well, actually, that's a, that's a segue then. I think we're going to move back to Solar Sister because the first question that we have for you, Abby, is around if you could talk a little bit more about the impacts and how you define, how you came up with the process, the steps taken to um, figure out your indicators, what kinds of impacts you were trying to measure. If you could talk a little bit about how you measure empowerment and then there were other questions about how do you define the steps to set up your process. For example, are Salesforce and TaroWorks readily accessible to everyone? And going back to the topic of, of personal benefits, um, are there any threats? Do you, do you track any challenges that women face? Uh, for example, with increased income, are they, are they in uh, more potentially dangerous situations, as we know can be the the case. Um, take it away. Sure, could you just repeat, sorry, that second question, I didn't quite get that one. Uh, the second question, let's see, how do you go through the steps of defining your process and what kinds of tools, um, how do you define what kinds of tools you can use to track your data, your impact? Uh, mm -hmm. Are materials like Salesforce and TaroWorks available and maybe what kinds of costs? There are quite a number of right. questions about Cost. Those are going to be more focused <laughs> towards Copernic. Lots of questions about the cost of the initiative, but maybe you can share some insight into that as well. Sure. So, in terms of how we chose our indicators, um, I mean, they're constantly evolving, and we're trying to get to a point where we have a very standard set that we can track. Um, but more and more every day, we're saying, oh, we can do this better or that better. We really want to focus this year on this component. Um, so, I mean, it's really been feedback from all of our partners, Energia included, um, definitely our partnership with the International Center for Research on Women. They really helped us being experts in this field of tracking women's empowerment to decide what factors we were looking at. And then we also looked as an organization, what was the impact that we wanted to make on the ground? And then also what do our donors want us to be tracking, which is obviously important as well. And so we really, I mean, 
we look at a variety of health, um, safety indicators, decision-making power, but what we really, really focus on at the end of the day is these two components of women's economic empowerment looking at income and not just what is a woman earning from her business, you know, that very stark she's increasing her business by this many dollars, but what is she doing with that money? At Solar Sister Refund, you know, women don't drop their other activities to become a Solar Sister entrepreneur. They add this as a very flexible business opportunity when they need it and as a part-time job. And so what we found is most impactful in Solar Sister's business and the income that women earn is where they're able to invest it and that they decide where that money goes because it's a self-run business. And so many women for the first time are able to actually produce a savings account or some sort of savings and you know, money for a rainy day because they're able to work with Solar Sister and it's this very consistent income that isn't dependent on the season like farming is. Um, and the other component we're really looking at is this clean energy access piece. And what we found in terms of women's empowerment is that women are really seen as leaders when they're the first ones to introduce this new technology to a community. So we try to see not only, you know, what are the very, very core benefits and basic benefits of clean energy when it comes to, you know, increase the amount of money that you're saving and it's much better for the environment, but also how are women perceived when they become in this leadership salesperson role with clean energy? How does that affect their relationships in the household? Um, and also, how can that lead to more economic empowerment? You know, many women talk about being able to use kerosene to study at night or run other businesses. Um, so we're constantly working on evolving that system, and we haven't quite gotten there and saying these are the best indicators to look at, but I think that's going to constantly change from year to year and what we want to look at and what we're going to prioritize. In terms of the cost of these systems, um, I mean, it really depends on the level that you're implementing at. TerraWorks is... Uh, I would say much cheaper than Salesforce just because there are more grant opportunities for it. It was developed by the Grameen Foundation. Um, each one has a yearly fee that we pay. Um, so it really depends on the size of your organization. And those, I mean, you really want to reach out to Salesforce and TerraWorks. I mean, they're really set up to work directly with organizations and adopt those systems and model them. And we constantly still work with them. And I think that I got all those questions in there. There were a few. I no, think that's I great. Know. And there's one more interesting question that I want to, I'm not sure I'm going to get this quite right, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try. It's quite interesting. Does the decrease in time on fuel wood collection of entrepreneurs, is that attributable uh -huh. or that can be attributable to both use of clean energy technology, but also cash income to purchase fuel or energy? Did you track changes in the fuel or energy purchase of, of women and her household over time? Sure. So what we were really finding was that 62% decrease in fuel wood collection was more of a result of using efficient stoves rather than them increasing their income and being able to purchase a new fuel wood instead of, um, instead of having to collect it. So we found that women were consistently still collecting fuel wood if they had done that before, that that practice remained. And it really was as, as a result of using less fuel wood because of the efficient stove use. But that's a great question. Um, and that is something that we monitor and we look at and we're still trying to figure out exactly how to do that. But I would say it was more a result of the use of the technology itself rather than changing the practice. Okay, thank you so much. Um, we've gotten a note, and I would like to share it, that some colleagues are online from Global Alliance for Clean Cook Stoves, and in partnership with the International Center for Research on Women, they've just released a publicly available toolkit for measuring social impact of cook stove interventions at the organizational, employee slash entrepreneurial, and user level. This toolkit includes a detailed how-to guide complete with decision trees to help decide which tools to use. So this toolkit is available at cleancookstoves.org. And if you haven't already, colleagues from, from the Alliance, please feel free to stick that, um, that hyperlink in the chat window for everyone to share. And of course, this will also be online, as I've said many times on our website. So colleagues for Copernic, lots of um, congratulations to you. I think uh, participants are, are quite blown away by your initiative. Um, several questions around costs for you. Can you give an idea of how much it costs to set up one of these systems? Can you indicate how much is the cost using technology, using your digital surveys versus the paper survey? Um, 
uh, and then a question around um, a participant's experience. One way to ensure that um, a husband or a neighbor or a male member of the household is not um, in some way intervening or participating in the interview with the wife or the woman or the female head of household is to have two separate interviews taking place in two different locations so that they can indeed be be separate. Um, do you find any challenge to this with the digital process? How do you know for sure that there is an interference and you're getting um, exclusive answers? Tomo, Lana, can I ask you to answer some of those? Yeah, um, can definitely answer the first question about pricing. Uh, a lot of the digital data collection apps are um, offer freemium um, options, which means uh, the the lowest option is free. Uh, and then if you want a little bit more uh, sort of advanced features, then you pay. So Comcare, for example, has a free pricing plan called a Community um, Plan, and then there are like three or four more levels. We, for example, subscribe to a um, to $100 a month um, plan, which is enough um, to cover our surveys and to have enough sort of data analytics built in. So that's the option that we use. So it's, it's not, you know, it's we're not, definitely not breaking, breaking our bank. Uh, it's quite affordable for us to do uh, what we need to do. Hi, and yeah, to answer the second question about having separate interviews or making sure that the um, wife is uh, not influenced by the husband or any other people who are present in the interviews, so far from our experience, we haven't really uh, we haven't really experienced uh, situations where we find it difficult to separate uh, the two or like um, make sure they're not influencing each other, but. Everything about the program, like involvement of the women in the program, uh, we have made it clear that this is about them, um, and we we have access to um, interview them exclusively uh, without the husband. Um, it has been going pretty well so far. And if, for example, the husband is at home, we just um, tell her that you know we want to talk to you privately. Is that okay? If it's not okay, can we come another time or do? Um, do it by phone, for example, so we can get um, just her answer exclusively and we make sure that she understands that we keep the data confidential, including from her husband and her neighbors and everyone. Great, great. Thank you so much. I, I think we've gone through the majority of questions. If I've missed any, I apologize for that and I encourage you to please be in touch with us, be in touch with the wonderful speakers and, and visit uh, the Green Platform where you can also share your questions. Um, I'm going to wrap up now and ask each of you speakers to share just a, a one minute key message that you'd like all of us to spend the rest of the day thinking about. <laughs> Lucia, let's start with you. Right. Uh, one key message. It is that in order to uh, to ensure that we do good tracking and good assessing of um, gender through the m e system, we have to invest in training, expertise, which means funding, but we also, at least in the case of development, large development projects, we need to keep our technical assistance ongoing throughout the implementation of the project and, and choose the key, sort of the key entry moments in the project when we can um, uh, piggyback on whatever the project is doing to, mon to, to do the monitoring and the, and the evaluation to make sure that it also collects information disaggregated by sex and maybe complement that with some other methods probably qualitative methods, to go more into the into the household. And that would be mm, all. Perfect. Thank you so, so much. Uh, friends from Copernic, Tomo and Lana. Um, yeah, um, our takeaway from this uh, is really what tool you should use depends on really 
um, if you look at the design of your program and how much resource you're willing to invest, like you see, I said, on training, on the infrastructure, hardware, software, and our impact tracking technology catalog is available online to help you with the process. Oh, fantastic. Tomo, anything to add? So just to add on what Lana said, I think, I mean, there are three steps to sort of m and &E in general. I think there's the, you know, there's the how, there's the what, and also the why. Um, you know, the tools that we've been talking about is definitely how, and I think the what needs to be clear. So what needs to come first before the how, but I think at the end of the day, it's really about why, right? So how do you use the data that we collect, I think, drives everything. So it's really about data utilization and being clear about that up front to that will determine everything else. Yeah, that's great. And I think the why, I, I love the quote that Lucia had at the top of her presentation, what is not counted does not count. And finally, Solar Sister, Abby, a key takeaway. Great. I would say, you know, following what Copernic said, it's really about using that data to affect decision making and setting up those feedback loops. If you're just gathering data and then it sits there and it's not informing your decisions as your organization, then it's really not going to maximize your impact in any way. I mean, the best data that we get in reality is the more negative data that says we really need to work on this training tool or this support mechanism. And if we're not getting the income levels that we want, what, what types of extra support do we need to offer to get there? So I think it's really about collecting quality data and then using that data to inform decisions so you can maximize the impact you're having on women. Wonderful. Thank you so much. That's a, a great note to end on. We're right on time. I'm very impressed with us. Thank you all participants for joining, for your attention, for your great, interesting, diverse questions. Thank you so much to our incredible panelists. We, we so appreciate your expertise and for taking the time to share your knowledge and experiences with us. A sincere thank you to our partner, USAID, under this Gecko initiative. Um, we are so thrilled to be a part of this joint program together and to our longtime wonderful partner Energia for their collaboration on this webinar and so many other things. Um, I want to remind you all that the video recording of this webinar is going to be made available. You can access all the presentations, you can access additional resources, uh, links from each of these organizations, contact information for each of these speakers, visit the green platform at genderandenvironment.org slash energy. And please join us next time for the next webinar, which will be November 17th, on the topic of political economy and how it can be a tool for gender equality in the energy sector. On behalf of my colleagues, and especially Ana Rojas, who organized this great webinar but was unable to join us today, thank you all so much for joining, and talk to you soon. Have a great day and a great evening.